with my father and my past partners, there was these emotionally unavailable men that I was like trying to get something out of them. And here I am in this relationship, maybe in this relationship, I will get something from this guy. Like maybe in this relationship, maybe the completion of my story is finally I'll get the boy. That is not the completion of your story. The completion of your story is never going to be that you finally get the unavailable guy. Hi everyone, I'm Julie, she's Kelly, and we're here to find love. We're back again this week for another Bachelorette recap. Today we're recapping episode 6 of Jen's season of The Bachelorette. For those of you who don't know us, we're two dating coaches who analyze the relationship psychology and dating themes in reality TV shows, especially The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. If you're into this kind of stuff, hit the subscribe button to follow along and join the conversation. You can also listen to us in podcast form on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. As always, feel free to share your comments as you're watching. Let's keep the conversation going down below in the comments. If you're listening on podcasts, shoot us a DM on Instagram while you listen. Get cozy, have a cup of tea, and let's get into it. And this week, Kelly is back, which I'm so excited about. <laughs> Yay! Hi. I missed you all. I'm so excited to be back. I have so many thoughts. I'm like bursting. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I'm sorry about my voice. I feel like it's like I'm scratching up. I've been... You must be talking so much, right? I've been talking so much much I've been you know on vacation chit chatting with all the people so you know you know how it goes <laughs> okay so in episode six we are back in Seattle which is interesting because we had been abroad for like most of the season and now all of a sudden we've come back and I can't tell if we've come back because they wanted to do this wicked date <laughs> which was the first half hour of this episode was dedicated to a big promo for the wicked movie and to be fair it was successful I now want to see the movie but <laughs> yeah, I, they brainwashed me <laughs> <laughs> the episode included a one-on-one date with Marcus a big old group date where there was a whole explosive kind of interaction between Sam and Jen which we're going to dig all the way into and then we had another one-on-one -on -one with Jeremy but let's start off with Marcus because this is his second one-on-one -on -one date so that's a pretty big deal usually if somebody gets two one-on-one -on -one dates it is because the lead really likes them or because the lead is questioning something about them those are the only two reasons why it might happen it was interesting so they had this whole wicked date they did this activity where they followed the yellow brick path and they had to choose this or that on these different like stations and it was like sweet or spicy fast or slow playful or passionate little prompted conversation starters I thought it was actually a pretty cute date they had a really easy and natural connection they seemed like a couple like watching them do this activity watching them kind of walk around they were interacting with some of the past bachelorettes and bachelorette contestants or bachelor contestants and it felt it just felt natural. They felt like a very, like a couple you would just see walking down the street. So I did, I don't know if I would say that I am like, oh my gosh, I really like these two and I'm like shipping them hard, but I could, I could kind of see it on this date. What did you think, Julie, about Marcus and Jen? Yeah, this wicked date, I mean, I loved the prompts because I felt like Marcus and Jen are both not really emotionally available people. At least they're learning how to tap into that side of themselves. And yeah. they're also not able to default to Jen's natural state of being, which is also really flirty and fun and bantery and witty. So then they have to lean on these different sides of their personality to express themselves around each other. And it ends up coming across a little bit more like they're just sharing presence with each other maybe they're energetically connecting on some level so I liked that the date literally forced them to have conversations that were very simple do you like this do you like that what does that mean to you so they were relating to each other in a way that I hadn't seen them have conversations before I still don't know if I love Marcus there's many reasons we can get into but I can see why Jen likes him before I didn't understand it now I understand why she is investing in him, why she likes him. Towards the end, when they went to that ballpark, they shared about their family and about, you know, he had such an awful experience going through the foster care system. And Jen opened up about her mom. You know, she received a letter from her mom. He received a video from his sister. Mm -hmm. And in the letter from the mom, she apologized to Jen for not having a perfect family. So they yeah. were able to relate to that. Very different experiences, but they both kind of walked away with it, with the wound of feeling like I'm not enough. I'm going to be abandoned. I feel like I can't trust my biggest parental figure. Yeah. And I thought that was so unique. I don't know if Jen really has that connection of that super deep part of her being super seen 
in such a specific way by somebody who really gets it too. So I, I did see that. I saw how teary they got. No, I, yeah. I'm with you. I thought that there was something about Marcus. First of all, Marcus's story was just absolutely, I, I did actually tear up. It's kind Same. of unimaginable, right? It's kind of unimaginable unless you've gone through it, this experience of not, it's, it's not even like I grew up without a parent or my parent passed away when I was young. It's my parents dropped me off at a daycare and never came back. Like that is such an mm-hmm. acute form of literal abandonment. It's not even like I felt abandoned. They were literally abandoned. And so it yeah. is, I can only imagine the type of like acute trauma that, that might cause you to experience and cause you to retain because then to go on from that and have this experience of going in and out of being like with different foster families, being with these families, thinking that they might choose you and then being sent back from each of these families. It's like a repeated abandonment, a repeated rejection. I mean, that is something that depending on how young, I mean, at any age, I think that will really mess you up. But if you are a young child, like that is something that I think it'll change the way that you relate to anybody, right? For your foundational experiences with your caregivers, various caregiving figures to be, you will give me like some level of, you know, attention and love and care and then drop me like a fly. Of course, that's going to lead you to be really, really hesitant to jump into a commitment with a romantic partner as an adult because you've kind of been Mm -hmm. taught that there's no reason to trust that anyone is going to stick around. There's no reason to trust that anyone who says that they love you is going to actually still want to keep you, right? You've learned that as a child. And so I, it kind of gave me a lot more empathy for Marcus, who has been talking this whole time about how he struggles to open up, struggles to be emotional in relationships. I had a very, a new sense of understanding what he means by that. I think I had kind of been associating that with just like men are often taught to suppress their emotions in general. And he was in the military, he had these like really, really emotional military experience or like traumatic military experiences. So I had just assumed that that was what had caused him to be very closed off. But when you add that into this horrible, like kind of childhood experience, wow, I'm surprised that he's even able to be in this experience at all. Like this, this relationship experience, you know what I mean? It was Uh, shocking. And then to have Jen be able to relate on some level, there was something different here about their connection versus what she has with, let's say someone like Sam M. So. (laughs) Yeah. It's, you made a lot of really good points about the clarity that we saw about Marcus because Oh my God, of course you would be totally reserved on this experience. You'd be reserved in a romantic relationship, let alone a popular dating TV show that's watched by millions of people around the world. There's a lot that you're putting out there and maybe he has been able to process, share, and talk to other people about his experience, but it's something that it's very tender. It's such a vulnerable thing to go through that it did give me more context and oh my gosh, like from him to go from a caretaker for his sister and then to being a military person where he's fighting for America, all of it just makes so much sense the way that he navigates and lives his life. I see something very unspoken between Marcus and Jen in terms of why they feel like they can really be connected to one another so I did see the connection a lot more and I can see it in Jen she is really really into him she really it's different than anything I've seen with any of the other guys there's something emotional which is so funny because they're not even talking about a lot of things a lot but when they do it's like whoa they can really get there yeah I think maybe it's because they've had both had such difficult, Mm -hmm. raw, like emotional experiences that maybe they're able to go there with each other in a way that is different. Like, I mean, Jenna has been opening up to many different guys about her past, but I do think that with Marcus, the two of them are, it's like they are both kind of seeing each other and going there together and like attempting to like excavate these experiences together in a way that does feel different from what she's doing with other with other men. One thing I will say mm-hmm. though is I'm definitely seeing it for Jen, like that Jen would be really into 
this relationship and into Marcus. But I did. This was actually the first episode that I was starting. You had brought this up, Julie, um, last week or two weeks ago that you kind of weren't sure if Marcus likes Jen that much. And actually in this episode, I actually started to wonder if maybe... And I had been like, no, you're wrong. They're into each other. In this episode, I was starting to see your point a little bit. I was starting to see maybe he is interested in the idea of exploring this thing with Jen, but he seemed a little hesitant. Like she was kind of like trying to pull them along, kind of pull them further along the kind of escalator to commitment. And he was putting up the brakes, which he's actually been doing for a few weeks now, actually, is putting up the brakes. And he did say that, you know, there's this canyon between liking and loving and I want to fall in the canyon, which was like, I think, suggesting that he wants to get there with her, but he's not there with her yet. It made me a little concerned because, you know, there's not that much time left. There's not that much time left for their relationship to build. And ordinarily, it would be okay if he wanted to take his time, if they wanted to take their time kind of developing that connection. But there's this is a the whole point of being on the show is an accelerated engagement process. So if you are someone who takes things slow, it's kind of like, well, why did you come here? (laughs) (laughs) It's no shade on Marcus. It's just like, I don't know that he's going to be able to get there in time. Right. So it does make me a little bit concerned about their relationship. Like I can see it for her, her really liking him and wanting to go there with him. I just, I'm not sure. I suddenly questioned it on his side. Yeah, I'm glad that you're seeing the light. <laughs> I, <was. laughs> I know. I doubted you. <laughs> you doubted me, and I understand why I'm seeing it that way. Is because I'm projecting. I'm kind of putting myself in a Jen shoes, and I've been interested in people that they haven't been super forthcoming with their emotions. They would blame mm. it on something. They had this thing that they were going through. They couldn't mm. give me what they wanted in the moment, but when they were ready with the right person, they actually would. So I was like, oh, like maybe it's just a connection with me. It's And mm. it's totally fine. We can't connect like this with everybody because we right. aren't meant to be, you know, we're, we're not meant to connect with everybody like that all the time. It would be chaos in the world. But I think <laughs> <laughs> just these deep loving connections. <laughs> deep <laughs> love with everybody. Everybody, just everybody falling in love like mad. Like I... <laughs> So when I was watching Marcus kind of, I noticed that he was like, ooh, I move very slowly. When they went to that choose your own adventure junction of the day, he really wanted to be explicit with Jen and let her know that. And then she countered with like, oh, you know, I like moving fast. And I thought this is pinpointing something. Marcus did want to bring it up. He did want to elaborate and give context about specifically telling Jen I don't know if I want to move fast in this relationship. He then generalized it to, I don't move fast, period. Yeah. So it's kind of, so she's not going to dig. So she's going to be okay with what he's giving her, which is fine. But she is looking for her husband. And he is, I don't know if he's totally ready yet. The previews suggest that he's not. And I can, I can kind of sense that as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, typically I actually would be sort of on Marcus's side. I do think that there's a good Mm. case for not moving extremely fast. Like when Jen was like, I move fast. I just want to like connect with people right away and like get really committed really fast. I was a little bit like, well, I'm not saying that that's the right answer. (laughs) Like, I don't know if I would. (laughs) They're both pretty extreme in this. Right, (laughs) right. It's like, I, I don't necessarily endorse like jumping in too much, too serious, too soon, because I do think that that, there is quite a risk there and you risk, you know, getting yourself hurt, like locking in with the wrong person and then having like a really painful separation process. And so I do think maybe it's like a middle ground that they need is something that allows for a level of, you know, thoughtful consideration and taking the time to get to know each other and open up to each other and making sure that the connection makes sense for them, giving someone like Marcus the time to develop those feelings because it does take longer. But yeah, again, it's like, Unfortunately, this bachelor process does not allow for that. You have to be, it's it's kind of like this show is really only for people who are like Jen, who are okay with moving really fast. And if you're mm. not that kind of person, this is sort of not the right process for you. It's, it's just sort of not the right place for you to be searching for a relationship, especially it's like the longer you stay on the show, 
Jen is giving up her opportunity to explore things with other people yes. who might be more willing to have make that commitment at the end of the day. And so we don't know if at the end Marcus is going to be willing to make that leap. And the longer that Jen keeps him around, the longer it, it, it just it is hurting her chances of having the happy ending that she wants. And so I'm a little concerned. Mm. I'm a little bit <laughs> And then you add in, to be honest, like there are some allegations about Marcus that are going around right now yeah. on the internet. And we try to be spoiler free, so we can't really even research them that deeply. But there are definitely some question marks around who this person is. And that's like another reason why jumping into relationships very, very quickly is maybe not the most advisable thing because <laughs> you want to be able to learn this kind of stuff about people. And people are often very, very charming in the beginning of getting to know you. So yeah, yeah, it it does the whole thing. I'm just, I'm feeling quite worried around their relationship is, is what I'm finding. Yeah. Everything that you're saying, Kelly is exactly what I felt when I was watching the episode as well. There are some things popping up on Reddit about Mark Marcus's past. It's not, it's not good. You know, I wasn't already feeling him because I didn't know if he liked Jen coupled of that coupled of the fact that I just don't know if Jen should be in a relationship with any of these guys, like a marriage. I'm just not so happy with uh, the quality of screening that's happened for her season. Yeah. So Marcus seems like he is a perfect example of that. A lot more come out as episodes progress, but I'm already telling from off the bat, like you mentioned, I can tell he's not ready to be with her. And if he's not, Mm. another guy would have been. And another yeah. guy would have been taken, had, like had a spot and maybe that could have been a different connection of Jen. So yeah. it just feels a little bit shaky all around. Yeah, I, I think that's that that was kind of my my main takeaway from all of this. And, you know, she likes him the most and just wants to see if maybe he like he can get there in the end. That's fine. But I also think that he also hasn't I mean, he's telling her that he likes to take things slow, but I don't I don't even think that he is registering how that might impact her journey like he hasn't really Mm. acknowledged that you know he likes to take things slow and also there's an engagement at the end of this jen wants to get engaged at the end of this if he sticks around to like try to figure it out is he wasting her time like i haven't really seen him talk about any of that or like kind of express any concerns around that so it does make me kind of wonder like is he thinking holistically about like what's best for Jen in this situation? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. And mm. of course he's going through his own shit, so it's not necessarily a critique of him, but I can see this being a very painful thing like later on in the season if he ends up choosing to go. Like I I can see that really hurting mm. her, but I mean hopefully she has stronger connections with other people by that point. Yeah. And what you said too was such a good point because Throughout the episode, they talk a lot about Jen's qualities. And one of the qualities that comes up is selflessness. This would be a really selfless act for Marcus to put her first in this moment and say, yes, I am allowed to have my the fullness of my experience. I'm allowed to take my time to figure this out. But if I'm getting to the end and I don't think that I am ready for engagement, maybe she shouldn't meet my family. Maybe I shouldn't meet hers. I really like her, but I don't know if I would get there even after we have these really significant milestones. That would be enough of an indicator to just kind of step back and be like, okay, I want her to find a person and I don't know if I should be there for that. It would be Mm -hmm. extremely difficult for Jen to feel, but it would be much harder if all of those things happen and then he pulled out. So I am hoping that we see some momentum of their relationship in some capacity. Yeah, yeah. I'll be interested to see how this one pans out because it was like they had such a beautiful date. It was such a long chunk of the episode that I was starting. I was like, oh, my God, like what? 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it was a really long chunk of the episode. So I was like, uh, are they is something something must happen with Marcus? Either he's the one or uh, they're gonna, there's going to be a dramatic breakup later on. But I was like, this is mm. a long date or maybe the wicked people just paid that much money to have. I think they paid that much money. (laughs) (laughs) One of those things. (laughs) They needed to pay for their trip to Australia. They were like, we got to take up 40 minutes of the episode. (laughs) I mean, there's so much between Marcus and Jen, and I can't put my finger on it. I just don't love it. Uh, Yeah. I just, I don't love it. Yeah. 
I have the same feeling. We talked a lot about Marcus. What do you think about Jen and Marcus? Do you think they're going to go the distance? Do you feel like Marcus needs to step out and just let her find her person and it's not him? Let us know in the comments down below. By the way, if you're enjoying this conversation so far, do us a favor and hit that like button on this video. It helps us out a lot. If you are listening on podcasts, give us a five-star rating if you're feeling so inclined and leave a review. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. It means the world. So then we move into the real meat and bones of this episode. And this is the radio date, the group date between Spencer, Sam M, Devin, Jonathan, and Grant. And oh my God, do we have so much to say. We see Jason and Molly Mesnick. They come, they are going to be there along with some radio hosts who just basically interrogate the men and see who has a good connection to Jen, if they can volunteer information about Jen, where Jen feels where she's really being validated and seen. Everybody does a really good job of describing what they like about Jen, describing the relationship, except Sam M. He starts to short circuit. He doesn't know what's <laughs> going on. He's never gone this long without Jen in his lap, the making out. So he like just doesn't know what to do. And it's just such a train wreck. I've never seen anything quite like this on the show before. I need to know what you thought, Kelly, because this was oh so unbelievable God. to watch. <laughs> it's I mean, so hard to watch. It was truly unbelievable because the questions were pretty straightforward. It was like, what do you like about Jen? <laughs> like, what is some, like, why are you into her? What is it about her that makes you want to get engaged? Like, that is, it's so straightforward. All you have to do is give an adjective. Like, it's it's not actually, these are not hard questions to ask about someone if you actually like them and you're mm -hmm. dating them it should be pretty easy to name a few things that you like about this person and the fact that sam couldn't do it not only actually in the radio date but the episode goes on and she has this conversation like two more times with him i think she has this conversation with him three different times at the radio date at the after party and then later on in the at the end of the episode she like goes to his hotel room she's she's she is interrogating this man she is really trying to see can you please give me any excuse to give you a rose? Like, it's like she is really giving him ample opportunities over the course of like multiple days to come up with something he likes about her and, and he can't do it. And so uh, I, it is genuinely like, I, I was flabbergasted watching him. What this behavior feels like is actually a very classic form of misogyny. It's this kind of like inability or refusal to view women as actual full human beings, human humans with these like real inner worlds who are worthy of real focus and consideration based on the way he was responding to these questions and the radio hosts questions. It just felt like Jen was an object to him. It felt like. He has clearly not bothered to actually take in any information about her, to learn about her, to try to empathize with her. It, it, it's like he didn't care to try to genuinely understand who she is and what she needs from a relationship. And, you know, it's she isn't being treated as a peer. She, she's not being treated as a fellow human being with her own inner world. It's like I sometimes encounter men who can have this habit it's very very subtle but it's it's kind of like when they talk to or about other men there's all of this nuance there's all of this depth and this sense of really trying to like relate to these like if I'm a guy talking about another guy it's like I can really like relate and talk about all of these things about this person make sense of who they are and I don't know whatever what they're doing in the world and you even see this in the way Sam is talking about Devin, actually. The way Sam talks about Devin, although it's like all negative stuff, he is registering individual specific things about Devin, right? Like Sam has said many specific things about things that Devin has said and done. He has reacted and retained information about Devin. And the way Sam has talked about Devin feels so different from the way Sam talks to Jen because it's like with Jen it's like it's all of these scripted lines it's almost like she's like not even a real person like he's just like kind of regurgitating scripts to her and it, it just feels like a form of objectification right it just feels like a form of I don't actually see yeah. this person I don't see this person outside of you know what women can do for 
men, which is, I don't know, help me attain the title of husband or father. And so, Mm. I don't know, to me, even though it seems like he's saying like loving and affectionate words to her, to me, what this feels like is, oh, so he like doesn't actually see her as a person. He didn't actually think that she was worthy of trying to be understood. And Mm. even someone you hate, Devin, you tried harder to understand him and to assign meaning to his actions than you did for this woman. So that's what it felt like to me. I just felt like it's not even like misogyny in a sense of like woman hate. It's like woman indifference. It's like a sense of like, (laughs) do women exist? Are they real? Like that's what it felt like to me. He wasn't able to produce any substance when in his conversation with Jen, he wasn't able to have reflection, validation, understanding, anything to let Jen know that not only have I been super present in all of her dates, paying attention to everything that you're saying, but I'm watching you interact to people. I'm watching you as, and I'm perceiving you the way that you hope to be perceived. The way that he sees her is not how she sees herself. And the way that he sees her is very one dimensional. It feels yeah. very sexual, very physical, very image oriented. You're mm-hmm. the bachelorette, you're a hot woman, you look like a Barbie doll, you are someone that makes me feel extremely attracted to you. We seem to like the same things. We talk about love the same way. And then it stops there. And it's almost like he has this gumption that just because I have these five things in common with her, this means this makes up for any level of interrogation, depth and meaning I can have in my connection with her. I don't need to have more because I have enough. And it's very superficial. It's a relationship that Jen has admitted she's had in the past where she has been of people that she's taught how to love, how to appreciate her, how to notice her, how to see when she's having a bad day. She's been able to give so much patience and considerations for these types, but that's not the relationship that she's wanting to perceive with this person anymore. This is not what she wants to have in her future moving forward. So I was really just awestruck by how he was acting on the radio day. He did this really gross thing where he could tell that he was absolutely failing and giving Jen an answer. So he just grabs her to make out with her. And he was like, you know, my love language is physical touch. It just felt so grimy because this was another example of him forcing Jen to do something. And it's, he's not reading her. He's not noticing her. He's totally misattuned to her. He doesn't, he's not able to pick up on her signals, pick up on what's happening around the room. He's totally focused on his own experience. And from that perspective and being in a relationship, you do not want to be in a relationship with somebody that only considers their interior world. That is a very selfish yeah. relationship where you're not going to be able to feel like you are somebody that can be paid attention to that they're going to consider you because he is so invested in what's happening to him and if he feels good or bad about it. I was just really frustrated by how he was interacting with her because he had multiple chances, like you said, to journal about it, to say, why is she so upset at me? (laughs) Like, why? talk about it to your producer, talk about it to your therapist. He was like, no, I really trust my own experience about it and that is a very narrow focus that's a very it's like an individual that only sees things this way and they're missing the whole picture yeah you know what it is like you mentioned that it's all about his own like his own internal kind of dialogue about himself or his own internal kind of story about himself that was like the thing that I was picking up because actually the way that he talks to about her, all of the few things that he said about her, which were like that he brought up the word selfless, but he didn't actually have any examples of her being selfless. And what we later find out is actually just, he wants a partner who is selfless. He has not seen (laughs) Jen be selfless. He just wants someone who is selfless. So he just used that word to describe her, even though he doesn't actually have any examples of why she is that. He is kind Mm -hmm. of just, he has this own story of his that he is trying to kind of put together he wants to be he keeps saying keep the main thing the main thing but the main thing is not Jen the main thing is him finding his wife and getting to be a husband right he is really only Mm -hmm. seeing Jen as far as how she can complete his story his own vision Mm -hmm. for himself and for his future she is just a tool for activating that version of himself right that he wants to step into she's just a tool for 
getting to be that successful, that successful vision of, I don't know, masculinity where I'm a father and I'm a husband and it like, I can like have Mm -hmm. those identities and hold those identities that I know other people find valuable. I want to have those identities and she's going to be the tool that allows me to get to that. But it's not about Mm -hmm. her. It's about how she can help him get to that ideal that he wants to be in. Right. It has nothing to do Mm -hmm. with Jen at all. Actually, she is literally like a she might she could be I think she even said this she could be anyone it doesn't actually matter she could be a blow-up doll she could be any like she it it doesn't matter who she is it's actually just about what who who is the thing what is the the object that is going to allow me to get to the, Mm. the place that I want to be and that's why when I say like it feels like a form of misogyny a form of objectification it's because it's like She's like not being treated like a like a human. This level of indifference to her, it really mirrors a very common pattern that does have roots in misogyny. And I guess we can't speak for how Sam treats other women because we've only seen him interact with this one woman. But to me, that's what this is. That's what this screams. This screams women are not people. Women are are things that will allow me to have sex and be a father. <laughs> like like that, mm. that's what this screams to me. Oof, I love how you were able to take that level of, of objectification and apply it to this dynamic that's happening between Sam M and Jen because there is something so opaque about the way that he sees Jen and he admits it. He thought she was going to be another bachelor, right? Daisy, oh my God. Maria, I don't care. Oh, I saw you and you weren't even my type. I didn't even like you at first. Then I heard all of these things. Then I realized I liked you and lucky you i'm still here fighting for you every single week do you think i'm the kind of guy that would watch the person i love like date all of these other guys like he just kept nagging objectifying and not seeing her the way that she is hoping to be seen and she knows that she's being seen by these other men she's had experiences and modeling from these other relationships that she's also dating that show her that they see her that they really value her that they want this co-created future with her and she can tell when it feels completely one directional and you know it was interesting because two things that i saw that happened or two things i thought about after i saw the episode one was i saw this article come out from molly mesnick and she spoke a little bit about the gen date and she actually said she didn't know Oh my God, I have to tell you, Kelly, like she didn't know anything about the guys, but the producer said Jen is obsessed with Sam M. She loves him. She's really into him. And that's what she knew about Sam. So she was like, okay, like, let's see if this connection can subsist. Like, let's see if it can thrive. And I saw on Reddit, because Reddit's kind of like this crowdsource. I think Bachelors is very into the Reddit world. And they were like, why did Jen like Sam M? Why did she keep him around for so long? And this is my theory. She had spoken about this a little bit throughout her season. We saw her mom apologize about not having a perfect family uh, in her letter that she saw in the Marcus State. When that happens, in one part of your healing, you could almost want to have that without really understanding what it looks like when you haven't had that modeling. She may Mm. have been more image oriented and I want to be with somebody that looks good that will that makes me feel good in this relationship but I don't know what this means she's going to be stumbling around and figure out what that is her uh father didn't give her the best experiences of what to expect in a healthy relationship so she was around people where she felt like she had to try that she couldn't be her full self that she couldn't be honest about what she was actually feeling and Sam M is kind of this perfect storm. I think you said this, Kelly, in the past, that it's almost like he's like the final boss in her relationship. Um, (laughs) I don't know if I said that, but I love this. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Right? Like, it's like he really represents all of these things about her past that she's working on. So, of course, there's so much charge to it. There's so much intensity around this person that reminds you of all of these things your body's saying you should be with him but you're fine tuning it in real time and you're like am I right am I wrong I don't know so I felt like there was a little bit of people not seeing the nuance in what Jen is going through where you know like Sam M I do think is a perfect storm for a lot of things that she's working on and it took her the time that it needed to take her to 
purge this out of the mm. system. I could tell that she maybe wanted to take him to Fantasy Suites just to get it out, but I felt like she was like, okay, I cannot keep this man any longer. I He's not giving me anything. What do I actually see in him? I don't know because he doesn't see anything in me. So am I actually, is this relationship truly what I thought? And I think when that started to click for her of, oh my God, I felt this instant physical connection with him. He didn't until after we kissed. And these things are not lining up. Wait, why do I like him? All of it starts falling into place. That's the aha moment when you make a change and you're like, oh my God, I got to get out of this. And it takes people the time it takes. I don't think there should be any criticism pointed towards Jen. Imagine this in your relationships. I'm sure there's something that you're working on that somebody could represent. It's extremely difficult to break out of that, even with people telling you. That's like something you need to find within yourself. Yeah. I mean, you bring up so many good points. I love the vision of Sam M as like the final boss for Jen. He's like the burly like the, guy. <laughs> yeah. The final boss that she needs to defeat to like kind of cross over into a state of like kind of healing and power. And that is, uh, that is exact. Cause he is exactly the, the wrong person for her, like to a T, right. He is all of the things yes. that she is trying to like, break out of of just falling for someone based on initial chemistry and having someone who doesn't like see her for her and having someone who doesn't mm. actually respect her respect her inner world and so it's like Makes all of sad. these things I, it's so sad this person who's not actually emotionally invested in her and she's being drawn to it because she wants to see can I I haven't gotten it in my past relationships Ugh. with my father and my past partners there was these emotionally unavailable men that I was like trying to get out of something out of them. And here I am in this relationship, maybe in this relationship, I will get something from this guy. Like maybe in this relationship, maybe the completion of my story is finally I'll get the boy. That is not the completion of your story. The completion of your story is never going to be that you finally get the unavailable guy. That is, Mm -hmm. I, I think that people, I don't think anyone actually thinks that, but I think there's a part of your, like your, you have this instinctive, like, it's almost like a compulsion, right? That like, Mm -hmm. if I can get this guy to love me, that's going to fix all my problems. Like, and it's, it's like a, it's not even subconscious. It's like an unconscious, like urge to keep coming back. And I think that's what's been happening to Jen with Sam. And literally like, I'm sure many of us had this experience of like screaming at the screen, like girl, let it go. Like she was (laughs) like every scene with him. I'm like, are you serious? And then in this episode, after the radio date, I was like, oh, she's sending this boy home. And she goes on to give him two more chances. I mean, she gave him two more chances. I was like, what is going on? And so I I did feel like, oh my gosh, like I wanted to shake her. Like, come on, girl. But you're right. You're right that it's like it, there's no room for criticism of her because this is something that she has learned from her past relationships. She is trying to outgrow a pattern And he is the final boss. Her being able to say, like, no to this relationship and being able to say, I'm not going to continue, like, shaking on available men, being like, please love me. I'm done with that. That is in my past. For her to be able to do that, send him home. And even, you can see she's even kind of upset with him. Like, by the time that she's doing her in-the-moment interview, she's, like, mad. She's angry. She's, like, she has all of this frustration about him. And I'm glad because the truth is like that anger shows that she knows that she has been wronged, right? That anger shows that mm. she knows that there is something that she wasn't receiving that she needed. And there is someone who has been treating her less than, and that anger to me registers that she keeps saying that she thinks that she has this voice inside her that thinks that she's worthless, but that anger shows that she also knows that that's not true. She knows what she deserves. And she's angry because she knows that she wasn't given that. And so I, I was so happy mm. to see her kind of reach that fever pitch of being like, all right, like you are being so ridiculous that it's like pissing me off. And I was like, go off, be pissed. You should be pissed. People should, you should be treated mm-hmm. exactly the way you want to be treated. You should be treated like the whole full human being who is seen and who is valued and who is listened to. And so if someone is treating you the way that this guy was treating you, then yeah, you should be angry, like go off. So, mm. I mean- I think she maybe defeated the final boss. (laughs) (laughs) I I actually think so too, because 
it was amazing to see her grow from, please, I'm giving you a chance. Like just say the thing I want you to say. It was sad to see her clock in real time. He was maybe hoping for another bachelorette, which is a wound that she already had of just feeling like, I don't feel like I'm the lead. I feel like I need to get into my season. And he is saying all of these things about how, in my perspective, the examples he was giving her was a little bit like, you proved yourself to be a valuable match for me. So here I am. I'm just going to love you and put my emotions into you. I don't know who you are, but I see that you have proven yourself to be somebody that I could love and I could marry and have a child with. It was amazing to see her realize in real time, oh my God, I have been giving a chance to somebody who... I was afraid of being wrong about and he wasn't the right guy for me. I think she said that in the episode was, oh, I can't believe that I had this connection with him. And that's a beautiful moment of clarity for her. I think it was really important for her to have gone through that entire experience and for her to walk out of that breakup, not blaming herself, not thinking I could have given more, I could have been different, but really seeing the reality of, we're just not meant for each other the way that he sees relationships and how I see relationships. This doesn't mean that, you know, like there's anything wrong about me. I just have to move on from this. I have to find somebody else who can give me what I want. And that was a very mature uh, response to the way that she perceived the breakup because it could have gone any way. I think in that kind of situation, if you're feeling really insecure, you might personalize it. You might start to think it's because of you. You might start to feel bad and blame yourself. And that's definitely not Jen's story. I mean, that's kind of what happened when Austin left, right? When Austin left, she personalized it, right? She was like, am I worthless? Like, am I the problem? Like, is it me? It was kind of like that triggered all of these like worst voices for her. And she did kind of go to that place. Unfortunately, she was able to lift herself out of it. But you're right. In this, this time, she got to make the choice to let this man that did not actually care about her go and say, you know what? No, I'm not going to stay in this relationship with this person who doesn't actually really care about me. And I'm going to go and find someone who does like, so for her to be able to make Mm. that choice and you're right, she didn't blame herself. She was able to really identify like, no, this person just didn't care about me. And so there's really nothing, there's not nothing, it has nothing to do with me, right? I mean, it was absolutely like mind blowing for him to say that thing about you're not my type. I thought it was going to be Daisy or Maria. I mean, in the context of this is our first Asian American bachelorette, it is such mm. a huge deal that she is exactly who she is. And The Mm. fact that he would even say that to her, say that on television, Mm. invoke this horrible, like, you were not my first choice kind of like story into her season. I was livid. I was absolutely livid to hear him say that. And frankly, to me, it feels like a little like a coded. It feels like a I don't normally date Asian women. I don't really. Yeah. I don't tend to find Asian women attractive. Like that's what that sounded like to me. I don't know if that's what he meant, but it's like really hard to hear it in any other way, given the context. And, yeah, you know, I I was I was just so shocked for him to say that. And, you know, whatever. Finally, she sent him home. She sent the man home. She realized that it was him and not her. And I'm happy for her. I'm just happy that she is growing past this type of story of like, man who doesn't value her man who only values her for her body like growing Mm. past that and into this new chapter where she's going to find a partner who really really values her for her exactly who she is and wants her this person jen this woman and i'm excited for her to find that do i think it's this final four Uh, i don't know but (laughs) but she'll find it i know she will but just it's out in the world (laughs) I mean, you and I got so heated talking about it because, you know, that the whole Sam M. Jen dynamic, it just inspires so much frustration. And where I really land with Jen is that I am so happy that she was able to process everything with Sam M. to reconcile all of these emotions and experiences and create this like really clear narrative around the type of behavior and man that she will pursue and accept moving forward her 
kicking out Sam M was a huge step because you could tell she really didn't want to. And I understand yeah. when you really want to be proven wrong, when you really want that person that you're yeah. so desperately wanting this validation, I really want you to be this person that will like me back. I really want you to be who I want you to be, but it's not happening. Yeah. It's, it was a big moment for her. Yeah. That's a really good way to put it. I think she wanted to be proven wrong. I think she kind of knew that he didn't care about her. And it was like she was holding out this hope that maybe actually I'm wrong and he does care about me and I'm just misunderstanding the situation. Like, I think she was like holding out this this kind of hope and yeah, she was proven right. And honestly, like that's even though it like it, it's so painful to like get that confirmation. So it's also painful. so great. It's so painful, but it's great. It's great for her to like realize that really realize and the fact that she even had the strength to interrogate him the way that she did and to really ask these really precise questions. I was like, I mean, good it was job, beautiful. <laughs> a good job, Jen. I'm so proud of her. Like, I just, my primary feeling to your point is just like, I feel so proud of her. I'm so proud of like the way that she's overcome this, this thing and she is moving on to whatever's next. Mm. I just hope whatever's next is good. <laughs> <laughs> A few steps right out of the season and she gets on a dating app. But, I know. <laughs> yeah. What, what I was also thinking too was when you're talking about her wanting to be proven wrong, it felt like to me when it's a situation shift that she was just hoping this can be a relationship, maybe this is something more. I get that hope. I get the optimism. And I also completely understand why it took as long as it did. So yeah. if anybody is confused on why Jen was interested in Sam M for so long, maybe reflect on an experience where you couldn't let go of somebody and you were like, why can I not let go of somebody that everybody says is wrong for me? It's, it's something that we all have to go through our, in our own pace, our own journey, and just receive a lot of love as we're going through it because it's already hard exactly. enough to be in a relationship with somebody like that. Wow, that's such a good, a, a really good point. I think that it actually reminded me of when people are in bad relationships, like when people are in abusive relationships, which I, not that I'm saying that that's what's going on between Jen and Sam, but when people are in a relationship where there is like truly like an unhealthy dynamic, people are always screaming like, why didn't you just leave? Or why don't you just leave mm -hmm. him? Like people are always saying that to the person who is kind of experiencing that abuse and uh, the truth is it's never that simple it's never as simple as just walking away and I think that's like a really yes. important thing to keep in mind that you know uh, you might know that someone isn't treating you the right way and still there's all of these like kind of voices and these past experiences and these contextual things that are making it so hard for you to get out of that relationship and so I think you know, we saw the end result, which is that Jen found the answers for herself. She was able to figure out what she needed to be able to exit that relationship. And I think the best way to support people who are in those types of relationships is to be, you know, that that loving shoulder, that person who is validating the things that she is experiencing as opposed to shaming her for not leaving sooner because she's just doing her damn mm. best. She's trying to figure it out in her own time and work through a very complicated situation. So I'm just proud of her. She did the thing she had to do. <laughs> yeah, she kept the main thing, the main thing, which was her <laughs> journey. I just have to use that last catchphrase because I'm never going to say that again in my life. So let us know in the comments down below what you thought about Sam M's behavior. Are you proud of how Jen handled the situation? Are you happy that he's never going to be on the screen again? let us know down below. And by the way, if you've watched this point of the video and you're not subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. We do this every single week. We recap every single episode of The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, and so on. So subscribe and follow along. Okay, let's talk about this Jeremy one-on-one -on date because I, at least for me, I have not been paying attention to this guy whatsoever all season. And usually if you haven't gotten a one-on-one -on -one date by the time, like, if it's time for her to decide who she's taking to hometowns and you have not gotten a one-on-one -on -one date, like it, it's usually you're, you're on your way out. Like it's not going to happen. So it was very, very shocking to see how well this date went. I was like, wait a minute. They got a lot of chemistry. <laughs> like they're, they're connecting, <laughs> they're laughing. I was like, this is really cute. Why haven't I seen more of this and more of them? I, I was really delighted by their connection. I, I liked that they have like a very similar sense of humor. I liked that they were both 
very playful. It just felt very effortless. And I, I don't know, what did they do? I, I actually don't remember. They were just walking around They Seattle, were or throwing was... fish, palm reading. Oh. Very, a very cute date. They didn't do any trauma dumping, which I also kind of liked. I liked that their date was just really even keeled. Yeah, it was just like a very, it was a lovely date. I think generally speaking, I love dates that are not like a whole big activity and it's more just like walking around like a new city and something like that because that's pretty realistic to what real couples do. Like just, you know, you're just walking around, checking out the market or whatever, you know. And so I think that the date felt very organic and this was a connection that maybe we just haven't seen much of, but clearly they had had some kind of pre pre pre-established rapport because she had like a nickname for him. She was calling him Jer Bear, which was like very cute. And I think that maybe they have been bonding more and we just haven't seen a lot of it. But the main thing that I wanted to talk about related to this date was actually in their evening portion, they sit down and You're right. Usually this is the portion where someone will talk about like something really difficult in their backstory. But this was actually a moment where Jeremy wanted to bring up his um, relationship to his culture as a Jewish man. And I, I loved this conversation so much because Jen also had the opportunity to talk about being Vietnamese and specifically being Buddhist and how that was a very big part of her family's like culture and what they do on the holidays and stuff like that. So the two of them were sharing all of these like things about what they would want their family to look like and what kind of like little cultural um, traditions they would want to pass on to their children or to their, you know, have as a family. And it was just really sweet. I was like, this is so cute. I, they were like kind of painting this little picture and Sometimes when conversations about interfaith relationships come up, there is a sense of like, it's like going to be a bit of a struggle because there's these different kind of religious beliefs and there could be like a clash and like, how are they going to raise the kids? But these two were just like so adorably like excited about the idea of giving these different parts of their cultures to their hypothetical children. And they were both so open-minded and even seemed excited. Like Jen seemed really excited about doing these various Jewish traditions. I think Jeremy was really delighted with how much she kind of knew about Judaism or Jewish traditions. And so uh, they were just, it was so endearing. I don't know. I felt my heart, like, I felt so warm watching this scene. I was like very excited. I would love to see their little, like beautiful, you know, Buddhist Jewish family come together. And I just feel like it would be such a rich and beautiful childhood, you know, like for those children, like it feels like it would be such a beautiful, like home to grow up in and such a beautiful family. I don't know. What did you think about this, Julie? In the last episode, we saw a little bit of their, them poking at each other when he was petting her and she was like, why are you petting me? And they were just laughing and flirting and getting into this really, electric conversation and you could just tell that there's a lot of chemistry between them it was nice to see their compatibility and them talk about things so with such an open mind because he was like it is important for me to raise my kids within the jewish faith and she was like well the buddhist uh tradition is also really important to me and he was like well if i'm asking you to really you know consider my upbringing of course we would you know merge these two together i would want to be really understanding And I loved that sort of conversation. I love that they were both able to be so open about, especially to the Bachelor show, just different religions outside of Christianity and Catholicism. They were able to say like, oh, you know, this really matters to me. What would it look like together? How could we manage this? And I just loved how they were really picturing their future together in a very earnest, sweet way. I really, really like Jeremy. I like Jonathan too. I actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I do think Jonathan and Jeremy would be quite good matches for her. I just don't mm. think she's that into them. Like she's into some yeah. of the other guys. So that's I, one of, that's why I'm not considering them or why I'm like, oh, I can see that. I just don't see her vibing with them the way she vibes with like Devin, for example. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think Devin is still a front runner. He's kind of faded to the background a little bit at this kind of juncture of the season, but personally, I love Jonathan, but I am with you. I don't think that she is that interested in him. Like I felt like their one-on-one date last week uh, felt, I I don't know. I just didn't really see that much between them personally, like uh, that much of a, I don't Mm -hmm. know, real attraction, at least for her towards him. 
versus with Jeremy, I will say like this actually skyrocketed him for me. It like skyrocketed yes. him ahead. I was like, okay, my picks for her. Honestly, ideally to me, she would pick Jeremy. Tell me. Like if I if I had to pick one of these final four, I think I would pick Jeremy because I think that she actually seems to be attracted to him. I think she's not like, of course, it's not the same as with Sam M where they were all over each other, but I think she's really into him. I think she likes how much they can be playful together because that's something that she has always said is so important to her. It's so important to her to like have, she always has humor is like her number one thing in a relationship. She wants like her partner to be funny and yeah, they're like cracking jokes left and right that whole date. So it felt like a really good, I don't know. It just felt like a really good connection to so I, and then you add in this beautiful interfaith intercultural like family visioning session that they had together it just felt like you could see the open-mindedness and you could actually see to me what this felt like they both seemed excited they seemed excited about the idea as opposed to sometimes and specifically I mean with interfaith relationships that can always be like there can be tension points and in general and interracial relationships like I, I think sometimes there is this like strange sense of like I hope you accept my culture I hope it's gonna be okay (laughs) like Mm -hmm. I hope yeah like this was something that we kind of talked about related to Jen and Joey when we were Jen went home right Mm. before the week of hometowns but we had explored the idea of what would it have looked like if Joey had taken Jen to hometowns and like there would be something very different about the way that he would be in her hometown versus the other the other girls that were were left in his season who were mostly like very traditional, like kind of, who were they? Like they were just very like traditional American families and very, very different from Jen's family story. But with Jeremy, it like didn't even seem like something like she, she was just, they both seemed excited. They were like excited to, to share their very different stories and backgrounds and cultures. And I was just like, this is what it should feel like. This is exactly like what it, sh- it should be exciting and joyful. And like, you know, that that's one of the best parts of being in a relationship with someone who is different than you. So you get to learn all of their, like their little, like their own cultural traditions and stories and like family things that they do. And that stuff is so fun. And so I love that they mm-hmm. had that excitement as opposed to this sense of like, I hope you accept me. It was like the acceptance was like the baseline. They didn't even have to like talk about like, will we accept each other? It was kind of like, no, okay, let's plan. What's our, what are we going to do with our kids? Which traditions are we going to do? It was like Mm. so exciting. And I loved that. I loved that as a, as a baseline for their relationship. So I found myself getting excited about Jeremy. I was like, this is the one I would pick for her. I saw it too. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we know who she sent home and I understood it after I saw the Jeremy date because he did do so well in how he naturally keyed into her, how he represents a lot of these attributes that she's also very, that she really prioritizes in a relationship. A lot of leads talk about this where they bring people to hometown. Sometimes they bring people who they're not, it's not like they're not as interested in them, but it hurts less to send them home because they know that they're going to have four and then have to send home some people that they're just like, who do I, which one's going to hurt more? And she was building such strong connections with Spencer and Grant that, I don't know, maybe Jeremy is that kind of match. It makes me sad because I do think that they're very, very compatible in terms of the healthiness. Now I'm worried. Now that you've said that, I'm scared. <laughs> I hope that's not why she chose him. I was so surprised that he got the rose. Like, I really was. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't surprised by the end of the date because... They seemed to have such a good good connection. So that wasn't the part that was surprising, but it was just like in the context of usually you are not the one who got the last one-on-one date. If you are going to go to hometowns and actually going to end up with her, you you probably have gotten a one-on-one date quite a bit earlier. But uh, so I, I, it it was just shocking. Like if before I watched this episode, if you asked me who I thought was going to be in the top four in no universe, would I have ever said Jeremy, no universe. I don't think anyone would have said Jeremy like he it felt like he came out of nowhere but I'm hoping it's in a good way and not like in a well it'll be easier to send you home later way (laughs) I know right were you surprised that Jeremy ended up getting the rose do you feel like it's because he's gonna make it to the top two or do you think it was what I said which is he was just the rose to give out so it wouldn't hurt as much later 
I hope that's not the case, but I have heard Leeds saying that's how they played the season towards the end. Let us know in the comments. Well, with that, we have our final four for Jen's season. It is Marcus, Jeremy, Devin, and Jonathan. I... Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay about this selection. I'm not... <laughs> I'm not jumping for joy with the selection, but that's fine. Here we are. I, I hope <laughs> I hope she's happy. She seems happy. I feel like when she does interviews, she seems happy about how this all turns out. So I'll I'll be waiting to see where this is all going because uh, uh, this is an I don't know. This is an interesting final four for me. I I don't know that I see it. It's like the guy that I like is the guy that she's least likely to pick. And the guys that she's most likely to pick are the ones that I'm like the least excited for her to pick. So we'll see where it all goes. Let us know down below who you're most excited about here and who you think she's going to pick in the end without spoilers. And we will be back next week to recap the Hometowns episode. I'm so excited about it. Make sure you're subscribed to our channel so you don't miss our recaps. And we will see you next week. Bye.